Oh boy. I can't win here. Okay, guys, it's it's great to have you with us if you're with us here tonight. Um, I'm experiencing some technical difficulties because it's just uh, just my life, the way things are. So um, we're glad, so glad that you're that you're here with us. And I'm gonna keep trying to do this again, and that's not what I wanted. I was trying to go live. Resume. Let's see if if uh, let's see if we can do this here. It's just not doing it. So I've been trying to uh, uh, get get the live feed up for um, YouTube, and uh, here. So here's my technical difficulty. I forgot my computer. I left it at my uh, place of employment. Um, so that's not working. I'm going to have to start all over. And that's the one that I uh, do YouTube on. So I'm trying to get I'm trying to get this going here, guys. I apologize like crazy about this. So we're gonna we're gonna try this again and uh, see what happens. Um, one well, just just please hang with me. I'm so sorry about this. Uh, it, I actually had this set up and ready to go, um, and as soon as I hit live, it uh, started to go live, and then it didn't. So I'm, I'm still working on this. I'm trying to make this as fast as possible. I, I'm pretty embarrassed about this. Mostly embarrassed that I'm uh, too dumb, <laughs> really, to know what I'm doing. Uh, sometimes I seem like I am. Okay, so we're going to try this and uh, see what happens here. Hey, there we got us, and think maybe, possibly, maybe we might be going live here. So I want to say hey to some people while, while I'm doing this. Um, it's just, it just ain't going to happen. So, so if you're, uh, if you're trying to watch on YouTube, I, I apologize about that. Normally we would have, uh, I'm just going to abandon it because it just keeps dying. Normally we would have uh, a feed on YouTube two at restoration movement 2.0 but i will uh, i will post this on there for y'all to look at uh, there and i'm making a playlist actually of these videos so um we're keeping these all together so here's what we're doing oh first off john raymond garcia hey there brother good to see you uh jose luis espinosa tim ogles the venerable tim ogles Hello there, brother. Good to have you with us. And Jonathan and Nathan and Jimmy and good old brother Bill Evans with us tonight. Thankful for that. I see uh, James Boswell, familiar face and a welcome name for sure. Uh, Bill Evans, uh, gospel preacher, preaching 100% the truth, even when it comes to eschatology. And he's here in Indianapolis as well. We're very thankful for him. And... Um, Oh, Rhonda's here too, so thankful for that. And Theo and Brother Roy Runyon, the uh, ever impressive <laughs> Brother Roy Runyon. So howdy to you there, brother. And uh, Vernon and Jeff, and I'm sure we're going to have plenty more. And and join us as we get get along with this. But here's what I want to say. First off, Trent's not with us. He's he's uh, out a courting, so uh, we're thankful that uh, he's found someone he can share his life with and we're praying for him and he's he will be coming back for too long i think and we want to wish him a a speedy and safe trip but until then we're going to talk about something that was actually a comment on the gospel truth number 66 this is when we interviewed norm fields norm fields has bible q a uh i i'm not sure what day that comes on i think it's on mondays but uh, don't quote me on that but either way norm fields um, I think he's a good man. I think he's trying trying to be a good preacher, and um, I think he's trying to teach what he knows to be the truth, which which we see, you know, and we, and we all do that. But we're wrong in many instances, and um, he's wrong about eschatology, and that's why we were talking. That's why he was on the program. So this is the gospel truth on YouTube at Restoration Movement 2.0, and he uh, we talked back and forth. But anyway, on the comments section. There was a man or somebody, I don't know if it's a man or not, uh, Johnny Doe, is, is, he made some comments. And we've been going over these. And these are supposed nails in the coffin of preterism, right? 
So there's no nails. And if they are, they're awful rusty and they ain't holding the lid on because uh, we are resurrected and we are coming up out of the grave, right? <laughs> so um, let's, let's do this. If, if you're new to the idea of preterism, preterism says, no, no, here's what it means. It's past fulfillment, okay? So past fulfillment of all biblical prophecies. That would be the full preterist viewpoint. Now, what that means is when Jesus promised to return for his parousia, his second coming, his return, and he said it to those people in that generation who were still alive, or he said some would still be alive, to see that event take place, then we believe it. We believe what he said. We're not going to try to skew that in any way. Well, um, so, so so we've been going through these nails in the coffin lid right but here's here's a, an, a problem so the last couple of episodes we've talked about this and, and this will be a completely new topic here that we're going to uh, take on here in just a moment there were some things that i wanted to bring out with this but i just did not have the time to make something up and i'm trying to figure out how to put graphics up you know um i could get a chalkboard i guess <laughs> but outside of that um well, yeah, i don't know but so we've talked about some other concepts already, but the idea of preterism is, is teaching what Jesus said to be fact, and that's that he returned in the first century. Final coming in the first century. Don't give me all this. Well, Jesus comes in many ways, and Jesus will come in certain ways. That's not what we're talking about. Of course, he's He's sovereign. He's He's got the, the, the ability to come in ways that he has prescribed, but not in an eschatological sense. There's no eschatology for the church today, and there hasn't been for 2,000 years. It was fulfilled in the first century, right? That's preterism. Now, I know that a lot of you are going, oh, no, 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 this is heresy. Um, really? This is exactly what Jesus said. Just before we get into this next point about the book of Revelation, um, and this is one of the nails in the coffin, right? So let me show you this. This is what Jesus said. These are the words that Jesus said. Matthew 16, verse 27 and 28. The Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Jesus said they would see him coming in his kingdom before some of them die. That's the, those two verses cannot be separated. And I know people are going to try to separate them, but but uh, you can't do it. And we've covered that time or two, but up to this point, uh, we'll just leave it at that for now because we've got uh, some, some other fish we're going to fry. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 34. Jesus said, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass until all these things take place. Now, if you had read verse 29, beginning, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other, you would have realized that Jesus again was saying that he was coming for judgment, resurrection, um, and his coming, his second coming in that generation. Verse 34, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. This is just a quick synopsis, Matt. Why, why the preterist view? Because we are simply following what Jesus said. That's it. We're not trying to add to it. We're not trying to explain it away. But let's just listen to this. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 64, Jesus said to Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, don't think he was talking just to him, just to one particular man. Because if you notice, it says there in uh, verse 57, those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. So the whole Sanhedrin was there. And Jesus says to them in verse 64, 
Matthew 26 and verse 64, he says, But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, this is verse 64, You have said it yourself, nevertheless I tell you hereafter. You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So it's statements like these and many, 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 many more that are proof positive that Jesus made a promise and he kept that promise. And if you think that people in the first century did not believe that Jesus made a promise, then I'm going to ask you before we get into our topic at hand, I'm going to ask you to look at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. So 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, no, 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 verse 3. So uh, 2 Peter 3, verse 3, know this, first of all, then in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, quote, where is the promise of his coming. Who made a promise to come in their lifetime? Jesus. So now you've got Second Peter written, well, I don't know what, uh, 65 to 68, something like that. It's pretty late. And the destruction of Jerusalem hasn't happened. Jesus hasn't showed up. Judgment hasn't taken place. Resurrection hasn't happened. And they're all going, well, wait a minute. He said he was going to come and we're almost all dead. This 40 years has almost elapsed. They knew that Jesus promised to come in their lifetime. You see, your problem is, if you're not thinking in along preterist lines, is you think that the Bible was written to you. And that every time you see you or you brethren or, or us or we, you think it means us today. This was written to people 2,000 years ago. And that's extremely important as far as interpreting the scriptures. You have to look at it from their standpoint how would they have understood it think about it like this if you had been there on the mount of olives when jesus was giving his all of that discourse there in matthew 24 23 through 25 technically and you had been standing just a few feet away from jesus and jesus said this generation will not pass away until all these things are fulfilled or all these things take place what would you think you would think hmm i'm in this generation Obviously, you're going to think that. Scholar after scholar, commentator after commentator says that. Um, let's see a couple guys here. Eric this is saying hey to me. So, hey, Eric. Uh, remember uh, Andy Griffith uh, show? And um, um, Andy would uh, always say, hey to Goob. I, I'm, not, I'm not calling you Goob, but uh, that just dawned on me there. Um, I see Alan and Eric and Wayne and Chris and JT and Nora and Stephen and Derek and Justin and Lennon and, and so many others. I am just honored that, that you are here studying with us. Now, let's get into looking at this next claim. And this could take some time. So um, just hang with me. But I'm going to try to do it justice. I'm going to try to keep each one of these points to one um, segment. So uh, that gives us about an hour roughly on each one. Okay, so the next claim here, he says, um, again, this is from the Gospel Truth number 66 on YouTube at Restoration Movement 2.0, number 66. I don't remember what date that was, but they're all numbered. And matter of fact, we're building a playlist of these very, this very topic here. Um, and this was one of the comments left. So his next comment is to claim a pre-70 AD writing for Revelation flies in the face of the general scholarly consensus that it was written after 70 AD. First off, I got a huge amount of problems just stacking up with what we've just read so far, and that's not even the end of the sentence, comma. Well into the 80s or 90s, towards the end of John's life, there are a number of reasons why it's illogical to give a pre-70 AD dating for this book. Okay. Um, where do I start? Let's start with God, right? So you've got these scholars, you've got Bible students, such as myself, who have went out on a limb. I, I used to go out on this limb. Actually, this never made sense to me. I'll, I'll be 100% honest with you. 
from the time I was a teenager, it never made sense to me why John would have written in 96. It never made sense. Of course, I didn't understand any of it, really. But that just, that did not, the cogs did not mesh, right, uh, with me back then. Uh, hey, Chris, good to see you, by the way. Um, and I'm doing, I'm doing my best, my friend, to, uh, to get it out there. So uh, I'm awful thankful and honored to have you with us tonight. Um, it never made sense to me. How, how could this, uh, first off, I remember being a teenager, you know, I'm talking 17, 18, 19, uh, you know, the late teenage years. And I had a friend who was a Pentecostal, and obviously he was a, a premillennial. And we would just go round and round and round, and, and I would try to tell him my amillennial position, which makes zero sense, by the way, uh, especially now that I know the truth. So I would, anyway, I would try to pit my amillennial position against his premillennial position, and uh, I, think he, I think he had a little more um, on me, truthfully, at, at that point, as far as, uh, as, far as that goes. Uh, premillennialism does not work either by the way, but we're, we're not talking about that so much. So I was very interested in, in learning about revelation, about prophecy and so forth. So I started delving into this and looking into this, and I had preachers telling me that books in the Bible, in the New Testament, could be written as late as 150. 150. 120 years after the death of Christ, 150, if my math is right. <laughs> no, no. And now that I know better, I know that inspiration ended, the gifts of the Spirit and the and Holy Spirit inspiration ended in 70 with the destruction of the temple. And there's plenty of passages that we can look at that illustrate that. So nothing gets past 70. Let me give you a couple examples. Let's think of a few things, okay? So let's look at the general bigger picture. And I know there's going to be a lot of people here that are, that are watching here tonight or who watch this ever. And they're going to say, well, John, you're 100% wrong about what I'm getting ready to say. Daniel, all of Daniel's prophecies, not a one of them goes past the Roman Empire. Okay, so we're looking at the general picture, right? Not a one of them goes past the Roman Empire. Let me say this one more time. Not one prophecy in Daniel goes past the Roman Empire. Okay, so Rome ended officially in what, around 600, something like that, just, just uh, you know, to be close enough for hand, hand grenades and horseshoes, right? So R Rome ends around 5, 600 A.D. Now, if what some of the preachers and brethren and scholars are saying today that there are these books, inspired books in the New Testament that were written at 150, okay, then it might fall within the purview of that general idea that none of Daniel's prophecies are fulfilled past the Roman period, okay? Well, let's just go to Daniel and let's look at a few of these things, ready? So in Daniel, we have to consult the prophet. <laughs> okay, so without doing an exhaustive study of Daniel, I just want to show you a couple of things. So in Daniel chapter 2, we have a kingdom that's set up in the days of those kings, which is the Roman, the Roman time. In Daniel chapter 7, same thing. This kingdom uh, comes to its full fruition. Um, Daniel chapter 9. What do we see? The same thing. The 70 weeks come to an end in within this Roman period. Now, I, I don't, don't get me wrong. I think that this nails it down um, even further than just this general time. But what you have to see is all of these prophecies are fulfilled. 486, gotcha. I knew it was five or 600 roughly. Um, thank you. So all of these prophecies are fulfilled within that Roman time period, okay? Because when the kingdom of the Lord comes, it puts an end to all of these governments. Now, that's not to say that it destroys Rome. 
Rome fell to pieces several hundred years after the events of 70. But what you have to understand is it puts an end and crushes all of these kingdoms. There were three of them that were already destroyed by then. So how could it crush them already after the fact if it doesn't come until the first century time period? Yeah, so, you, so you have to ask yourself that question. Well, it's because it's not a physical kingdom. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Otherwise, my servants would fight. We didn't see them fighting this way. Peter lops off a guy's ear getting ready for the battle, right? He's got his sword and he's carrying it around with him and, and he uses it. And Jesus heals the guy and says, Peter, put your sword away. This, this, isn't, this isn't what we're about, essentially. Now, so we've established that the kingdom comes in the first century. And we're talking about inspiration. Yes, we're still talking about inspiration. So by the time you get to Daniel chapter 12, notice verses 1 and 2. Now at that time, Michael the great prince, who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. For many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Now, wait a minute. Did he just say there was going to be a resurrection in these days? Now, some people who think that they're pretty slick, they say, well, this was at the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, about 167 or so, when uh, Jerusalem was destroyed. And it was destroyed, and there was a slaughter. If that's the case, then judgment and resurrection happened almost 200 years before Christ came. That doesn't make sense. That, that would not fit at all. And Jesus quotes Matthew chap, in Matthew chapter 24, uh, about verse 21 or so, he quotes Daniel and he says, this is the time of these things and it will never happen again. So did the destruction, did Jerusalem get destroyed once more and finally after Antiochus Epiphanes? Um, yes. And Jesus said it would never happen again. Okay, so the idea here is that these things, these events, came to an end in the first century. And if that's not enough for you, look at verse 5. He says, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others were standing. This is Daniel 12, one on one bank of the river and the other on that bank of the river. And one said to the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river, How long? Will it be to the end of these wonders? The end of what wonders? And what is what is he talking about? Judgment and resurrection. The gospel being preached. We see there in verse 3, um, 3 and 4. When will the end of these wonders come? When will these events take place? When will the fulfillment of this prophecy be? So the answer comes in verse 7. I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river. As he raised his right hand, and his left toward heaven and swore him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. As soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. Well, who are the holy people? And, and if that's Christians, you have to say, hmm, well, then uh, the Christians were shattered. You're going to shatter Christianity? Remember, Jesus said, my words will, what, endure forever. So that doesn't work. So this had to be, and we could look at several verses that illustrate that the holy people here being mentioned are the Jews. They're the ones that were, uh, you know, uh, chosen. There you go. <laughs> okay, they were, set, they were set apart for the Messiah and to bring him. Now, so all of these events take place in the first century. Judgment, resurrection, the coming of the Lord, all, all these things take place in the first century, according to these prophecies. So could Revelation be written after 70? So we know that inspiration is going to come to an end. There's no new books of the Bible being written, folks. Um, who, who are you? How are you going to prove that you're inspired? Because those gifts came to an end in the first century. Let's look at a passage here in Zechariah chapter 12. I'm sorry, 13, Zechariah 13. Notice what it says, verse 1. In that day, what day? Go back to get the context of this through chapter 12. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And he mentions in that day, let's see, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven or eight times. And he specifies that this is Jerusalem. So in that day, it's no question that this is when Jerusalem is destroyed. 
In that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and impurity. Well, when did that happen? When was the fountain opened in Jerusalem for sin and impurity? It was in the first century. It was in the first century, not the second century, not halfway through the second century. Okay, in the first century. Now, notice he says in verse 2, Zechariah 13, it will come about in that day, same day we're it is not switching gears here. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land. They will no longer be remembered. I will also remove the prophets. Wait a minute. Remove the prophets and the unclean spirit from the land. Well, let me explain something here. Prophets are these men that spoke for God. There's no other way around that. These aren't bad guys. These are the good guys. And in that day, these prophets are going to be removed from the land. Now, notice the language that's used here and the unclean spirit. Now, do you remember in, I think it's, I'd have to, I'd have to look it up. Matthew 8, Matthew 12. Uh, you can find it faster than I can tell you where it's at. But um, the demons uh, that were possessing the man, the legion, said, have you come to torment us before the time? Well, they knew their time was limited and that it was up shortly. And then he cast them into the swine. They ran over the, the cliff. They knew their time was up. Um, and there's plenty more to look at here too. But let's just, let's, let's just try to stay on this because I, I want to uh, show you some other things about the dating of the book of Revelation. Okay, so in that day, the prophets are going to pass out of the land. If there's no prophets, no inspiration, God's not speaking to the prophets. Were the apostles prophets? Yes, you better believe it. Uh, 2 Peter 3, verses 1 and 2, proclaims them to be prophets just like the prophets of old. Same with uh, Matthew chapter 23, um, around verse 39-ish. Proclaims them to be these guys that are going to be persecuted and put to death, just like the prophets of old. There's no question. Okay? They were the last ones. They were the last ones. There's no prophets today. There's no inspiration today. Nobody's writing new books of the, of the New Testament. All that information is, is, has been perfected, and we don't need that. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. Um, that's funny. Okay, so in that day, the prophets and the unclean spirit will pass from the land. But let's keep reading Zechariah 3, 13, uh, verse 3. And if anyone still prophesies, okay, after this prophets are removed from the land, are they dead? No. They're still around. So they try to prophesy. If anyone still prophesies, and his father or mother who gave birth to him shall say to him, You shall not live, for you have spoken falsely in the name of the Lord. So you have this prophet who was one day, he was okay to prophesy, and the next day, he's going to be put to death because he's what? Doing falsely in the name of the Lord. And his father and mother who gave birth to him will pierce him through when he prophesies. And it will also come about in that day that the prophets will each be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. They will not put on a hairy robe in order to deceive. But he will say, I am not a prophet. I'm a tiller of the ground. I was a prophet, but now all I can do now is garden or be a farmer. <laughs> See? So they even understand. The prophets understood that once that spirit departed, that inspiration departed, they were no longer a prophet. That's why in that day, at the destruction of Jerusalem, no more prophecy, no more inspiration. You can't have inspiration without prophecy, right? You, you got to say something to prove it. John chapter 20 teaches pretty clear that Jesus did all of these things by miracles. And he did so much stuff that, you know, you just couldn't record it all. And he did it to prove who he was. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. Listen to this. Then I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, if you're going to have Jesus coming in the future because you think the Bible is written to you today, because you read all these things that says us and we and you and them and 
uh, so on. Okay. And you read that and you interpreted it to mean, hey, this is me. He's talking to me. No, he's not. He was talking to the Thessalonians or, or the Ephesians or the Galatians or whoever. But he wasn't talking to us not 2,000 years later. And the people that received these letters in the first century, no way, period, that they ever would have thought, oh, well, this is going to happen 2,000 years from now. They knew it was coming in their lifetime. Matter of fact, check this out. They actually thought that Jesus had already returned and they missed it. Why? Because there are people coming in the name of the Lord saying that Jesus has already come. Matter of fact, he's out in the wilderness. And we can read through history that this happened and several thousand people lost their lives for doing that. Hmm, interesting. So the events we're talking about happened in the first century, happened before this destru the destruction of Jerusalem. Inspiration stopped when Jerusalem was destroyed. And Hebrews chapter 9 illustrates that, well, I'll just, just have to show this to you. Hebrews chapter 9 says, verses 8 and 9, the Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. So these things stop at the time of reformation. What's this time of ref reformation? When the temple is destroyed. Yes, James, the majority of the Bible scholars got it wrong because they relied on men. Are you going to look at the Bible and you're going to say, this is when a book was written because a man said so. When God gives us clear, undeniable proof about when it was written, I'll tell you, well, I'm going to go with God. I'm going to go with God. This temple was given as a sign. When it was destroyed, that was the sign that the law of Moses had come to the end. The Lord had returned. Maybe not necessarily in this, this order. So the Lord has returned. The judgment has taken place and the resurrection has taken place all at the same time. Now, there is no way to get around that based on everything that we've looked at already. And I know if you're joining us just now, you're thinking, uh, you've lost your mind. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. Jesus said, now either he was telling the truth or he didn't get it himself. I think he got it. As a matter of fact, I believe it. Jesus said there will be some standing here who will not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now you're going to make that a figurative seeing, but when you talk about Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through 11, that's literal. Come on, be honest about it. Uh, that, uh, you know, that doesn't work. It, does, it just doesn't work. It's not good biblical exegesis for many, 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 many reasons. Um, <laughs> yes, Chris, we are farther away from his uh, coming, not nearer. That's exactly right. Because he said, specified when he would come. Now, um, so we've looked at uh, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. And that said that the testimony of Jesus is prophecy. If you're going to have Jesus coming in the future, I have to point this out before I forget. If you're going to have Jesus coming in the future, you have to have prophecy preceding his coming. And if you believe that we're talking new prophecy, somebody's going to have to be prophesying this. And if you believe that, then you're going against everything that the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that prophecy came to an end in 70, Zechariah 12 and 13 and 14. Came, it will come to an end. No more prophets. No more false prophets. No more unclean spirits. In 70, when the dis temple is destroyed, when Jerusalem is destroyed. Prophecy proves Jesus. Either Jesus knew what he was saying and his prophecies came true, or we're serving a false God, someone who claimed to be a God, who claimed to be deity, who claimed to be the Son of God, the Messiah even, and didn't have a clue what he was talking about. I am going to go with the fact that 
he was all of those things. He knew what he was talking about, and he did not fail on his promise to come in their lifetime. With those passages we mentioned before at the beginning of, of our study here tonight. Uh, <laughs> um, Chris, you're going you're to make me do this, aren't you? Okay, well, let's talk about this. Um, I, I had an opportunity to talk with somebody this this morning, a preacher. And he uh, said Jesus was coming soon. So I said, this is through over Facebook. And so I said, um, I'm not trying to be mean or anything here. Really, I wasn't. I, I wasn't. I was just simply asking a question. So I said, um, um, how soon is his return? And immediately he answered me back. No one knows the day or the hour. So then I said immediately, if no one knows the day or the hour, how can you say it's soon? <laughs> so he, he, he never responded. Immediately he did not respond back at all. Okay, um, so this day and the hour is back there in Zechariah 14. So let's let's go ahead and do this. Uh, I should have done this before. I know, I know, I know. Um, but there's really some points I really, really want to get to. So Zechariah chapter 14. This is where um, Jesus quotes from. This is his source passage when he quoted and he said what he did in Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 and following. And he says, only the Father knows. No one knows the day or the hour, only the Father. Now, listen to this. Um, so here we have verse 6, Zechariah 14. In that day, by the way, that in that day has not changed. All the way through chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14. It's all talking about the same thing. So in that day... Well, what is in that day? Does chapter 14 start a new thought? Look at verse 1. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil will be taken from him and divided among you. And I will gather the nations against Jerusalem to battle. Wasn't he just talking about Jerusalem being besieged in battle and the nations coming against him? So it's still the same day. Um, in that day, verse 6, there will be no light and the luminaries will dwindle. Didn't we read that in Matthew 24, 29 to 31? Yes, we did. For it will be a unique day which is known to the Lord. Didn't we read that in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 and following? Yes. Well, we didn't read it, but we could have because it's there. We just didn't read it today. It's the same thing. So what does it mean? Jesus said, explains what in that day is. It's just like in the days of Noah. They're going to be partying it up, living life, and then comes their destruction. They don't even get it. But the ones who are aware will be just like in the days of Noah. They're going to listen to the Lord. They're going to enter the ark. They're going to be safe seven days before. <laughs> Do you realize that Noah knew when it was going to rain, right? Yes. Just like Jesus said, just like in the days of Noah. He said, this will be just like in the days of Noah. Noah knew when it was going to rain. God said seven days before it was going to rain. He said, Noah, get in the ark because in seven days it's going to rain. Did Noah know the day and the hour, the specific hour, he knew the day, but he didn't know the hour. Maybe it was in the evening time or at 6.30 in the morning. Who knows? I don't, I don't know. The Bible doesn't record when it was, but neither did Noah. He didn't know, but he knew the day because God said in seven days, know it's going to rain. That's exactly right. Now, what does that mean? It means that God, Yahweh, knew the day and the hour. And so did Jesus. Jesus knew. Listen to this. So here you have Jesus going to, this is all proof that Revelation was written before 70. Okay? So Jesus knew the day and the hour. How did he know that? Because in Acts chapter 1, he ascends into heaven. And while he's in heaven, we see in Acts chapter um, 9, 10, Right? Anyway, um, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's, he's there. He's in heaven. So we know he's in heaven. Acts 1, 9 through 11 says that he ascended into heaven. Stephen said he's in heaven, and I see him. 
So Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bondservants. And Jesus goes all through Revelation telling you when he's going to come. He doesn't tell you it's going to be on this date, but he knew it would be when? At the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, the destruction of Jerusalem is extremely important. I know, I know, I know. You've never heard of the destruction of Jerusalem. You thought, wow, that's, that's no big deal. Um, you would not have thought that the destruction of Jerusalem was no big deal if you had lived through it. If you were a Jew, by the way, so you've got Revelation written to these seven churches hundreds of miles away or further. Written to these seven churches hundreds of miles away. Why were they written? Why was it written to these churches hundreds of miles away? Um, let's examine this. First off, from Patmos, where this came from, and you cannot, sorry, uh, James, love you, brother, but I don't care about tradition. Brother, I don't care about what men say. My dear brother, James, I'm telling you right now, it was written at Patmos, but you cannot prove that John was imprisoned there at this point. You can't do it. You can't do it historically, and you can't do it biblically. He says he was there for the cause of the gospel. Was he there preaching? I don't know. Was he there to write? I don't know. And neither do you. And neither one of us can prove it either way. But let's think about this. You had Patmos was here and essentially located. And if you look at the order of these churches, it's like a spiral wheel just going out from Patmos. Okay? So... Patmos was here, and then uh, it goes to the first church, and then the next one, and the next one, and the next one. It gets copied each time, and it goes out, and then it spreads out even further. And it would happen very rapidly. So you might say, well, well, Jesus through John was trying to warn them not to go to Jerusalem. Yeah, um, I, can, I can go along with that. But even more important than that, or at least equally important, Okay, pay very close attention to this. Revelation was written to these Jews. Yes, they were Jewish congregations. You, I, I, it'd be very hard to find an entirely Gentile congregation. Very hard. Um, I'm not saying that there weren't any, but the vast majority were Jewish in, in their population. Okay? Uh, the Jews... This righteous remnant was accepting Christ. Uh, and you might think these congregations were 100, 200, 300, 1,000 people. You were lucky if they were 15 or 30 people. Just saying. You know, they would all meet in someone's home. You're not going to fit more than 30 people in a rich man's home, generally speaking. Okay, so they were rel relatively small. But these guys went out preaching. They do what we do not. They believe with all their heart, and they go out and they tell people, even if it costs them their fame, their fortune, their life. They love their lives not unto death. So, Revelation was written to these seven churches. One, to warn them about the coming destruction, because he says, Jesus says in Revelation chapter 1, listen to this, these are the things which must soon take place. Now, you're going to have to stretch soon and make it as rubbery as you can to make it 2,000 years because it does not mean that. It means immediacy is what it means. Just the same way we use it today. Guys, tell your wife you'll be home soon and take three hours to get home and tell me that she's okay with that when she knew it should have taken you 40 minutes. <laughs> you, you already know the answer to that. So, yes. These things are getting ready to happen. Stay away from Jerusalem. Don't get caught there, okay? But equally and more important than that, this was to alert them that the Lord was returning, judgment was taking place, resurrection was happening. When all of that happens, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, guess what that means? The law of Moses is coming to an end. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 8 and 9. It's the symbol for the present time. 
When that symbol is gone, the present time, which was the law of Moses, is over. More importantly than stay away from Jerusalem, it was here it is proof positive. Prophecy proves Jesus. Revelation 19, verse 10. Jerusalem was a huge, huge deal. 1.2 million, 1.1 million, whatever, people lost their lives in the siege of Jerusalem. Not to mention all of the people that after that were taken into captivity, slavery, and died shortly afterwards. Not to mention all of the people who had died before that in the wars taking place around Jerusalem. I'm making a circle with my finger here. You get it? Huge, huge loss of life. There was so much blood that they were literally wading in it. It was so horrendous that these people, mothers, would kill their own children or at least wait till they died and then eat them. Atrocities. Unspeakable. Now, Jerusalem was a huge deal. There is not one single book in the entirety of the New Testament, or the Old Testament, obviously, that talks about Jerusalem in a past tense. Okay, God just dated every book in the New Testament with a general date of before 70. Now, you're either going to go with some guy, or, or Irenaeus, <laughs> uh, or you're going to go with scholars today that interpret it based on their beliefs and what they already believe or you're going to go with these guys who are willing to go out on a limb and go against scholarship and say jesus said it was going to be soon he said it would be in their lifetime i'm telling you right now 150 a.d is not their lifetime a generation according to hebrews um, is about 40 years. And this is God's time. You know, do you all not believe that God can tell time? Please tell me yes. I beg of you, tell me yes. Because if you think God can't tell time, he's the one that made it, guys. Really, 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 really? God made time. He set the sun and the moon and the stars in the firmament. right? <laughs> the firmament and put them there. Why? To keep time. Do you think that God thinks a thousand years is really a day? No, 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 no. Do you think that a day is really a thousand years? If that's the case, then Jesus is still on the tomb. <laughs> Come on, that's three days. You're going to pick and choose or you're going to be consistent. Let's just be consistent. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse um, verse 9, uh, where your fathers, yeah, I, I hate to just jump in the middle here, but we're going to have to do that. Um, of course, after having said all that, I probably just could have read it. <laughs> See how my brain works. But verse 9, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation, a generation, a biblical generation is 40 years. Add it up. Go to uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. With the genealogy, it's about 40 years. I think that comes up to 41. It's essentially about 40 years is what a biblical generation is. So these guys that said in, in 2 Peter 3, in verse 3, well, he promised to come in our generation, in our lifetime, and we're all about dead now. Where's he at? They understood. Why? It was written to them. It was spoken to them. It was said to them. It was communicated to them. That's the reason that Jesus communicated the destru impending destruction of Jerusalem to illustrate to all of these brethren, you've got this righteous remnant, the saints, the elect, and then you've got these faithful brethren, these Christians, who um, Gentiles, essentially. And they all need to know that Hey, these are the events getting ready to take place. It's going to be fulfilled, just as Jesus said. Okay, here's something else. I want you to think about this. 
if Jerusalem isn't so important, then why is there so many Old Testament prophecies about its destruction? <laughs> Wouldn't you think that if Jerusalem had been destroyed after, or I'm sorry, before the New Testament was completed, that you would have all of these prophets saying, see, here's the fulfillment of this prophecy. Let me point this out. But they didn't do that. Every one of them said, it's about time. It's coming soon. It's going to happen quickly. It's the last hour. That's what they were saying. They all knew these prophets in the first century, these apostles and these prophets knew in the first century, guess what they knew? <laughs> guess what they knew? They knew and believed through faith Jesus and what he said, that his word was going to come true. His prophetic word, his promise would come true. And they were counting on it. And they were comforting one another with these words. First Thessalonians chapter 4, comfort one another with these words. Listen to this. What does he tell them? We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. If you were listening to this, what would you think? I'll tell you what you would think. You would think the same thing that you think now because you think it's written to you now. But put yourself 2,000 years ago when this was written. What would you think? 1 Thessalonians 4.13, We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For if... For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. What's the word of the Lord, by the way? We're already talking about these things. This is the Olivet Discourse, by the way. This we say to you, verse 15, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. Do you suppose that any of these brethren 2,000 years ago at Thessalonica read this and went, Phew, we don't have to worry for 2,000 years? No way. No way. No how. No. Just, just, just. Brethren, it's just not possible. Friends, it's just not possible. It's not even feasible. They would never, ever have thought that. Until some scholar comes along today and wants to impose his beliefs, his personal beliefs on you, and say, because I'm a scholar, you have to listen to me. This is exactly what James said just a little bit ago. And I think maybe I saw someone else say this too, that, you know, these guys... They are not infallible. Well, yeah, they do a lot of good work, but they're men and they can be wrong. Just, just like I can, just like you can. Okay. Um, let me keep reading here. First Thessalonians 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. Do you suppose that? They believed that Jesus was going to come in their lifetime? Yes, because Jesus taught it, the apostles taught it, the brethren believed it. It's just that simple. It's not any more complicated than that. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. You've got all of these scholars who say, and do, um, for any of you who have said that the scholars were right about the, the writing, the dating of Revelation, These scholars say, oh, so, so tell me if you believe this about the same scholars. And they say, yes, the Thessalonian brethren and the brethren in the first century and the Christians in the first century did, in fact, now wait a minute, here's what they say. Yes, these Christians in the first century did, in fact, believe that the Lord was going to return for his second. And final coming within their lifetimes. But they were grossly mistaken. <laughs> that's my best impression, guys. I'm sorry. But that's what they say. Do you believe them then? I hope you do. Because they w did believe it. They just weren't mistaken. And Paul proved it to them. Let's get back to this idea of uh, Revelation and when it was written. So we were there at Revelation chapter 1. We were illustrating through verse 1 that Jesus knew now because he had been in heaven. The Father had given him that knowledge. It's what Revelation 1 and verse 1 says. This is the information that was given to him by God while he was in heaven. Now he's communicating it to 
John to give to the seven churches. This is something that will take place soon in verse 1. Must soon take place. It's not optional. It's not open-ended. Must soon. You look up the Greek language there. Look at the end of verse 3. He says, uh, that just blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it. For the time is near. Any of you, any of you guys out there ever had a pregnant wife? I went through this three times. And she says, it's getting close. It's getting close. By the way, the coming of the Lord is equated to the travail of a woman, which is 40 weeks. And the coming of the Lord was within that generation, which was 40 years. Hmm. 40 is pretty significant. And your wife says to you, it's getting close and it's, it's a month away. And you know that's only four weeks. And then, then she says, honey, it's getting pretty close. And then it's a couple weeks away. Then she looks at you and she says, oh, these Braxton Hicks are killing me. If you know what Braxton Hicks are, you've really been through it. Okay. Oh, these are killing me. This must be just right at hand. I mean, this is right here. And she keeps telling you the time is near. Do you, for some crazy reason, say, oh, what's going to be two years away? <laughs> no, no. Simple logic doesn't, doesn't allow us to do that. Um, man, oh man. All right. The time is near. That's what he says. Then he quotes Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Behold, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Who are those who pierced him? They were the Jews. They were the tribes of the earth. They were mourning and wailing. Why? Because they were still alive, some of them. Those who pierced him were responsible. He's quoting Zechariah chapter 12. Let's go back over here and look at it. There's so much in Zechariah 12, 13 and 14. In Zechariah chapter 12, notice what it says. Verse 10 I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. When did that happen? The day of Pentecost. Joel chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 3, for that matter. And it's all quoted, right? So Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. At the time that the spirit is poured out, it's on the day of Pentecost, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him. Oh, well, this is just similar language, John. <laughs> this is what people say all the time. This similar language does not mean identicality of thought. Let's put it this way. Boy, it sure is coincidental, isn't it? It's the same language. talks about the same piercing, the same people at the same time. And then he says, the tribes of the earth will mourn. Well, listen to this. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. It was their son. They were the Jews. And they will weep bitterly over him like bitter weeping over a firstborn. Guys, if you can't see this, I, I'm just going to keep praying for you. That's, that's all there is to it. Because this is so powerful. you got to catch the power of this. And... Uh, I don't mind to thank Don Preston for that phrase because it is just awesome. Just plain old great stuff. But anyway, but do you see how powerful that is? Did you catch that? I hope that you did. Let's keep reading. In that day, there'll be great mourning in Jerusalem, like mourning in Hadramimon in the plain of Megiddo. Friends, all of these things happened in the first century at the destruction of Jerusalem. So did Jesus make good on his promise? Yes. Jerusalem was destroyed. It was horrendous. Every Jew alive, including the prophets in the first century, would have written about it if it had happened during their lifetime. 
while prophecy was still intact and operating in inspiration. They would have been shouting it from the rooftops. Here's the fulfillment of this. Every book in the New Testament was written before 70. John A.T. Robinson, Robertson has a uh, great work on this. And that's really what he bases it on. And he gives lots and lots and lots of other information, none of which really I can remember right off the top of my head. I'd have to read that again um, and reference it. But fantastic information. Every, check it out, Redating the New Testament, John A.T. Robinson. Uh, uh, and, or was it Robertson? Robertson, yeah, one or the other. And he gives this just fantastic information. Hello, Dusty Rose, by the way. Great to see you. Long time no here, right? But uh, I hope all is well with you. Um, so do you, get, do you get it? Now let's look at some other things. Revelation had to be written before 70, otherwise it would have been mentioned as a past occurrence. This is the book of prophecy. This is the fulfillment. He's saying when all these Old Testament prophecies are going to be fulfilled, if one of them have been fulfilled, don't you think for a second they would have been shouting it from the rooftops and saying, look, here's proof that God did what he said he was going to do. Instead, they said it's soon. The time is near. It's the last hour. So on. All right. Revelation chapter 11. Verse 1. Then there was given to me a measuring rod like a staff and someone said get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it did you catch that did you hear that did I do that however that goes I don't remember dusty rose I am I'm mourning with you I, I Certainly am. Um, certainly keep you in my prayers. I know how hard it is to lose a loved one. I, I just hope and pray they were in the Lord. Uh, maybe you'll let me know that. Um, Revelation 11, verse 1. They were worshiping in the temple. The temple was not in heaven yet. Right? Or the ark, anyway, wasn't in heaven. In heaven. Heaven hasn't been opened. This was the temple. Hebrews 9, 8 and 9. It was still existing. People were worshiping in it. Now listen to this. Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it. For it has been given to the nations and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. The temple is standing. People are worshiping in it. The Gentiles, don't measure that, he said, for they're, they're out there. They're certainly not going to be in heaven at this point. Under those rules, I mean, you got to see that, right? Okay, so you've got the temple standing, people worshiping in it. You got the outer court, and then you have this being tread under foot for 42 months by the Gentiles. It has been given to the nations, they will tread under foot the holy city for 42 months. How long was the siege of Jerusalem? 66 to 70, mid 66 to 70. It fits. Um, was the temple destroyed where people couldn't worship in it? There was no outer court? Yes. So, hmm. Then you've got this idea, and people want to say, oh, well, Revelation was written in 96, and not one word, not one proof by God that his prophecy had been fulfilled. Now, if you're going to say that Revelation was written in 96, listen very close to this. You're going to say that God has a bad memory or that the destruction of Jerusalem meant nothing to him. He just forgot all about it. After all the times he ensured that it was mentioned in the Old Covenant. Guys, use logic. Would God make a prophecy and then 1,500 years later, when it's fulfilled, never mention it. And then you're going to go with some guy named Irenaeus, who thinks that Jesus was 50 years old when he was crucified. Um, he says he remembers things better when he was a boy than he does in his old age. I can't remember what I had for breakfast, but I can remember exactly what I heard when I was six years old. Come on, it doesn't make sense. 
It doesn't make a bit of sense. Irenaeus was wrong about a lot of things that you're going to reject, but yet because you want to protect your paradigm, guess what you do? You say, oh, well, Irenaeus was right. It's the only thing he was right on, guys, just about, by your estimation. Man, oh, man, oh, man. Um, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. So we see uh, uh, lots and lots and lots of places. This, this puts me a little over an hour. Uh, but I think that's sufficient. I, I think there's a lot there that we have, uh, that we have talked about and um, we've looked at, and it's just, uh, it's just there. It's there. And the only way that you can not see this is to simply close your eyes. And if you're going to do that, and you're going to blind yourself, then what you're doing is following the blind. And you'll both fall into the ditch. That's a real big problem. Okay, we're going to leave it here. Um, here's what I'm going to request of you personally. Um, I will do my very, very best to get this a video posted to YouTube and added to the playlist about the nails in the coffin of preterism. So this is part three. Go to Restoration Movement 2.0 on YouTube and hit the subscribe button. I'm working on freeing up enough time and uh, so forth. There's lots of projects that I want to do, um, but uh, some interesting stuff. And Lots of uh, these videos actually are archived there too. A little better, easier to find on YouTube. Maybe a little better quality. But the Restoration Movement 2.0 on YouTube. Uh, subscribe. If you would please, it would be an absolute honor and a privilege to have you share this video in your timeline. And I encourage you to do that. And I thank you for those who, who do that religiously. Um, I mean that literally. <laughs> um, but I thank you so much for all of that. And I, I, just, uh, I just thank you so much. I, it, I cannot begin to tell you what an honor and what a privilege it is to be with you all every week and to sit down and open God's Word. And this is, this is just how I am. If I'm wrong, I'm going to change. I don't want to be wrong. But it ain't easy to sway me because I want to be right. I want to follow the Lord. I, I, I don't care about men. I love men. I care about them. But I don't care about them enough to follow them so I don't hurt their feelings. The truth is love. Now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, the greatest of these is love. That love is the new covenant, by the way. It works great in, in weddings, but that's what it actually means. God loved us, John 3, 16 that he gave his only begotten son. You get it? So what we have to do is love the Lord enough to follow him, even if men don't like it. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that ain't easy. To use a uh, Hoosier phrase, that ain't easy. It's not. But it is following the Lord, and that's what we're expected to do. So um, what if we don't? Thank you all so much, and I and I certainly do, certainly do um, appreciate you all. Just 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 put your heart into it, study it out, pray about it. Uh, I'm going to ask you all to be praying for Dusty Rose at the loss of her cousin. Um, I know she is just a wonderful, wonderful woman, and uh, you're not going to find a better a better believer. Absolutely not. So uh, keep her in your prayers. That's about it. Um, by the way. I never said thank you to my wife for joining. Uh, I can't leave her out. So uh, she is my everything. Maybe I can make a song about that one of these days, make millions of dollars and give them all to her. That She would deserve every penny of it and then some. Okay. Um, I appreciate you all, and we'll be with you next time. Check out Restoration Movement 2.0 on YouTube, and we will see you next week.